Hey guys, uh, this is Vicente Bolea, and this is the first seminar for a series of seminars, which uh, I want to give it to you to explain about certain things that actually uh, now I'm finishing my undergrad, and then I thought, what if I, when I start my undergrad, I knew the things I already know. So that thing and that I have to do some volunteer hours then made me realize that, oh, what if I do a seminar about those things? So, okay, so let's get started. So first of all, uh, this seminar, it's uh, aimed to uni students, which is my home college. But any other person can actually see it. It's in YouTube. I'm going to make it public. So... <laughs> Well, you can you can use it if it is useful for you. It's nice for me to know. Otherwise, you can just move to another video. <laughs> okay, so let's get started with the first session. So Linux developing stack. So what do I mean by that? Uh, I came up with this term like uh, because nowadays you hear a lot about developing a stack. So well, so. The idea is that uh, when you're using Linux, uh, and especially the command line, you have all these tools that uh, they made it together to make a very nice environment to help you to code and debug and publish and compile, build, everything. So then here's, uh, let's start. Hold on. So let's talk about myself. Uh, my name is Vicente Adolfo Bolea Sanchez. It's a Spanish name, I'm from Spain. However, I did my undergrad in South Korea. And during my time there, for all every year spent there, I also attend as a lab intern at the data intensive data intensive computing lab the ICL uh, along my professor and during my time there I focused my research in supercomputing and big data analysis and processing and mostly to actually implement the frameworks and figure out different cache techniques to speed up those big data systems so uh, all the all those research actually end up with the implementation of a big data big data framework called Velox. That at this moment I'm actually working on that. Uh, a part of that, uh, I got the chance to attend a few supercomputing competition as a student, one in China and the one in Germany. And well, during my time. I was always a very enthusiastic about Linux and well, since my middle school, I guess, I was always about, oh wow, we had this operating system that you can actually see the source code and you can actually change it to whatever you want. That was very attractive to me and that's somehow what it keep me motivated to continue my path towards this. And well, that that's all about me and what about this presentation? So I separated three segments about the people who might find this one useful and I came up with some reasons why. So as an undergrad student, as I explained a little bit before, you might find that uh, in the situation where you need to deliver some assignments, however, you don't know how to use some tools that maybe some of your friends are using and maybe you're stuck about that because in our university in Unist, for example, you are supposed to use Linux, but they don't explain to you mostly. There is some seminar like this, but in the course there is not much information about how to use Linux tools. And the other part is that in the next seminar, I will also introduce the concept of how to collaborate with other people. So for graduate students, uh, I got to work with other graduate students. I'm actually myself a graduate student now, even though I didn't start my courses yet. 
So you also, on, on, on the one hand, you still have to deliver a lot of assignments for your courses. And on the other hand, you get to implement a lot of things, mostly in Linux, related to your research. So most of the time, you're going to be actually working in a Linux machine. So the, the lessons I'm going to go through, it will also actually help you with that. And for people who is outside of, I mean, they're not either a graduate student or undergrad student, or they're not computer science students, uh, it will help you somehow. If you have some some motivation towards to learning about Linux, or if somehow it's beneficial for you, well, it's a uh, it's little knowledge I'm going to give it to you. You might find it useful in your career. So in this session, uh, the previous one was an introduction about the whole seminars, not only this one. But in here, let's start talking about this specific one. So in this first session, we, we will talk about system programming software and tools, uh, different frameworks to actually, what, what I mean by framework is like, you have this set of tools working together. So that's what a framework, it's kind of it is. And then some tools related to C++ and C, and about dependency and packaging. So this is a very, actually high level, a diagram of what usually work with Linux. So we are very uh, familiar with the concept of uh, cloud computing, as you might know. So you have your phone and your desktop and your laptop, and then you synchronize your pictures among them using maybe iCloud or Google Photos. And so everything is in the cloud. Your, your files using Dropbox or Google Drive, your uh, documents like docs and you using as a Google Drive. And the same idea actually applies for a Linux programmer. But the fun part about this one is that uh, it's not a new thing for them. Maybe since the beginning, it was always like that. When by the time that they had the mainframe, those very huge computers in, in a separated department actually, uh, they had these thin terminals or whatever they call it. And they actually, similarly, it's a cloud computing. Everyone connected from outside and I store everything in those big servers, which it might look like a cloud. So this idea, so you have uh, using every kind of client, like a Mac computer or Windows computer, or actually another Linux computer, or maybe an Android phone or Android tab and a Chromebook, you can actually connect with all of them to uh, your Linux developing server, and you're actually developing that developing server. So everything remains there, and it's independent to, what, independent to the client that you actually connect to. So <clears throat> uh, I came up with this idea. Uh, so this presentation, I wanted to be very informal, and I wanted to show a little bit what's my actual preferences. So I've been for four years university in Unist and one more year as I exchange student and one year and a half in another university. So it's been quite a lot. And I kind of came out with this combination of software, which actually comes very handy for whatever I do nowadays. I must say that I mostly call in C++. Sometimes Ruby as Ruby well, or Python, it happened to call some time. But I'm very, very focused on C++. So in my situation, what I found the most useful one, it's, a, it's an operating system. I mostly use OpenSUSE or Ubuntu or CentOS, but uh, I lean more toward to OpenSUSE. That's a personal preference, actually. I don't really take it as, as uh, I don't really have any a strong reason to not to use Ubuntu or CentOS instead of OpenSUSE, but I just happen to use it. As a text editor, I'm a strong follower of VIM. And there are many reasons about that. Maybe the one main reason is that you're going to find it everywhere. Uh, it's, they, they has, I mean, every single computer actually have a even tiny implementation of v, VI. 
So mastering that editor, which actually it's uh, it will speed up a lot of your work. It's actually it's gonna allow you to use any machine and remotely mostly. It's very lightweight and it's great. Terminal multiplexer. So a terminal multiplexer is not something that you have heard probably. So the idea of a terminal multiplexer is like a, it's a, let's say when you're using your browser and then you have many websites open, you have these tabs, right? And then it's very easy to open a new tab and it's such a great idea because you don't need to open a new window to open a new website. And well, it's a light way, it's good. So the same idea actually applies to when you're using the terminal. So you actually can have several terminals open in the same way that you have several tabs in your browser. Uh, actually, I'm gonna spend more time about this. So, well, you can see a little bit later. And then for compiler GCC, mostly CLN and try now this, but GCC somehow I'm used to for many years, whatever. Uh, my main language and hard language because, well, it's a uh, compared to, it's a compiled language, so it's hard. So my main compiled language is C++, obviously, it has all the good things about C. And at the same time, it gives you the, well, all these object oriented programming uh, features and also some other, uh, what do you say, functional features like, and it's actually, it's very complete and it's very extendable and I don't know, I found it very, I found it great actually. And yeah, I'm going to spend more time about this one as well. And then about a source language, I mean, a language with not compiler, compiled. Uh, I mostly use Ruby. It's uh, my preference is toward to the syntax, not any other thing actually. Toward, to, I mean, compared to Python. And then coding style is a Google standard. Uh, I think it's a standard in the C++. And it's actually, I don't know, it looks your code to, it makes your code to look compact. And at the same time, it's actually very clear. And they also have these tools to actually auto indent your code in that way. So it's actually, it's easy and it looks good. So uh, this is the main content of this uh, seminar. And for each of the things, uh, I might actually go to the, my terminal and actually show you an example how it works. So uh, the first one, it's about Tmux. If you remember, actually, uh, I mentioned about this terminal multiplexer thing. So here's the thing. Uh, Tmux, you have different types. Well, you cannot really see it. So uh, let me make an example. Uh, so here's my terminal. And then uh, I execute Tmux. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's not, it's open to see. <laughs> well, it's not a thing of it. Ignore. I don't want to use L at the moment. Well, too many broken repositories. I don't want to disable right now. I mean, I might have to disable, but uh, I need to check well which repository is that one. I install a bunch of things lately. Uh, well, finally. We go. So well, uh, I'm already installing Tmux. So well, if you're using a different Linux, you might uh, execute similar command. So yeah, yeah here we are. Uh, let's execute it. So this what we get. So it's a uh, it's a nice thing actually. Uh, I'm gonna come back about this later, but uh, it has certain information that it shows. Actually, I customize it. Uh, I made a whole project actually about how to customize these tools. That I, I will explain like a shortly after in this presentation. So, what is the main thing about this Tmux? 
So you have this terminal here, maybe you execute dates and then you open a new um, app and here you are. Yeah, now you have two tabs and actually it works with the mouse, which is nice. And then in the second tab, you well, no, you have the VIM open and then it goes a little bit more. You want to open one more and then uh, HTOP. Uh, I have a very bad machine, as you can see. <laughs> And yeah, it's a great thing. You can have all the tabs together. And what's a good thing about this one is that uh, you can actually uh, detach it. So what I mean by detach? I press Control A and then D. So it's Control A and then Release and D. And now it's detach. So I close my terminal. And now I open one more time the terminal. And then I do tmux attach. And here I am, everything is big again. So what's, what's the usefulness about this one? I mean, it's obvious in your local machine, it's useful, but what if you're using a remote server and maybe you are in the library, you are with your laptop and then you are using that remote developing server. And then uh, you actually, uh, want to go for dinner and then you turn off your laptop so you can detach actually your station in your remote server and then when you come back later maybe in your apartment or whatever it is you can actually reattach so you can continue where you left huh? so you have the same number of terminals it's everything it's same so <laughs> it's great right so Tmux actually it's a little bit newer project than the very previous one and, and kind of like a traditional uh, terminal multiplexer. So the, this other project is what's actually called a screen. I might have it installed actually, yeah, it's actually installed. So as you might see, it looks a little bit more primitive and it has similar comments and then control L, the, I mean the same comments actually, and then the attach, was it? No, uh, I kind of forgot how to attach with screen. Yeah, retach. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's the R option. So yeah, and well, so in the previous slide, I actually, I said that uh, I prefer Tmux opposed to screen. And the reason is obvious, Tmux is more new. So yeah, that's the first thing. And I think that that's maybe one of the most useful things that you might find is that uh, uh, you can make your session in Tmux in your remote server. You can do your homework, your projects there, and then you can keep it open always. You don't have to close and open whenever you turn on your computer. So second part, and that part is nice. Actually, I'm, I got very pretty excited when I, I I found that uh, this very low level, super common line, I mean, like a text oriented debugger actually has such a feature and it's actually pretty useful. I use it, I wouldn't say every day, but uh, once in a week at least actually. And sometimes it's really a speed up to you to fix some bug. So how to do it. So let's say, Let's say that, uh, let's make a directory, session one. Okay, wait, I had this one already, forgot it, sorry. So this is a remote developing server, as I call it. And in here, uh, I'm gonna make a file called main.cpp and then in that file, it's fairly simple one, it's just like, a, I want to make a bug actually. I stream and then main using time and space TV. Okay, good, good. Here we are. So let's play about the integer overflow. That's actually nice. So I have a unsigned. Here call a, which is equal to 
Uh, what was up with this one? It's here. And then I had this integer called B, which is equal to A. And then it's, this is not zero, it's actually, uh, but it's, uh, it should be 32 and then 32, so one. Two. And then minus one. I want to get actually the maximum. So in here it will be like a very huge number, but it's positive. And then when I so now the problem is that actually in B. So uh, I mean, if I tell you, then it doesn't look like an error. But uh, that happened very often. So maybe B. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we can do like this. So. You might think that actually, which one is bigger? This one or this one, which is very huge number. So okay, let's say what, what maybe the computer thinks actually. Is it A bigger than B? And then if it's bigger, it will print out A is bigger than B. Look, I'm trying to... Uh, inputs some sort of error or it's not actually a compiler error this one but it's a runtime error that's why we're using gdb right and then everything looks fine here let's compile this in huh. you got a warning interesting and then Thirty-two, maybe thirty-four. Yeah, I'm the thirty-four machine. I'm kind of confused about that. Eight. Well, so the idea is that uh, if I cast a to int, yeah, maybe. So I made this one. Yeah, well, he he here we are. So if I cast uh, a to int, because otherwise, uh, actually, a compiler might, co might complain with a warning that uh, you are comparing integer, I mean, unsigned and signed integer. So you might actually put a integer. I mean, you might cast actually then sign to sign, and then you got this thing that even though actually you had this very huge number, actually the maximum you can represent as a unsigned, you actually get that. Uh, well, the big number is actually according to the computer is smaller than one. So that's a good example of an integer overflow. And then we execute it, and then what? What do we get? File. We get nothing, which uh, if I recall to the call, it's this condition is not done. Okay, anyway, so let's see that we don't know what this one we want to find out using TDB. So let's go through. Oh, sorry, I need to compile with the IG is fine. Uh, and then, so uh, it's important when you use GDB is to uh, include the G tag. So the G option actually uh, generates the debugging information, and then you can use GDB with that. So GDB with the TUI, uh, TUI uh, option, it's it, 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 it will make the window like this with the source code. And Uh, 
Ajá. Ajá. No. There's something weird happening here. Okay, I my mistake. Uh, I think I had to specify now. Maybe this one comes first, and then. Oh. Let's try with this. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go the other way around. Uh, love. Sorry, sorry. Uh, file. Take out. Okay, here we go. So yeah, we can see uh the source code of the file, and then yeah, I mean we um uh, many things we can do. So first thing, it's uh okay. What about we put a breakpoint in line ten? Yeah. So we can see the breakpoints actually visually we can see it and then it's pretty helpful. And then let's uh, make a breakpoint at line seven and then we're gonna run it. Here we go. So we are in line seven. So actually we can see it with this small thing. And next, so now we are here. And then yeah, well, we can inspect what we have. So we have this, uh, so A is actually the, um, the bit are flip, it means that if it's unsigned, it's the largest number it can represent. And then uh, B, actually one. Yeah, that's the fun part about this interior overflow. And then uh, we go through the condition, the uh, condition didn't work at all, and then we are out. So yeah, here's the thing. It's pretty nice actually, and it's really helpful. and if we well so you, ha you have all the options for uh, you have in gdb just uh, some kind of window that you get there so i recommend you to use it and you're not gonna miss any visual studio or whatever other maybe uh eclipse uh, debugger it's actually pretty neat and i totally recommend it so that's all, all for this part I think it got stuck. It's never ever happened to me. So actually I'm using a remote server and that might be the re situation. Let me check it out. It actually looks fine, I'm connected to the... Anyways. Okay, so this is a very small tool and very quick one, but uh, it's actually very convenient. <laughs> it's actually fun that... Uh, uh, for a long time. Well, so I'm going to explain to you. So uh, let's reconnect to the remote server. So I normally have to sometimes uh, check the logs. Not sometimes, actually, every day. And for such a long time, I always uh, check it with the following comment. A second. Keyboard is now a very awkward situation position that's why I have some problem with this so uh, I go to the log and then uh, I want to check some assist log for example I hope I'm not revealing any important information that you might use to hack my computer so now you get this thing that's uh, so you need to run this tail command all the time if you want to see the last message right and then, so one guy might come smart and then he might input this wedge command, which it's gonna actually execute this command continuously every one second. And yeah, it actually works once every one second. I mean, nothing is happening now. It looks static, but it's actually. So, well, and then I found that I had this comment uh, it's actually uh, 
it's actually just like uh, keep reading and then if it's something new just show it and then for a long time i use it and then finally recently actually i found this other command which is actually the same thing it's an alias for that thing and i found it very useful so memory leaks are uh, I think that uh, in the computer science undergrads, we they talk a lot about them, and actually they are pretty uh, inconvenient thing, and uh, it's really hard to find it. So maybe one of the hardest parts actually are about memory leaks because you might have a pointer which is pointing to some memory address which is not supposed to be pointing, and then you assign some value and then you happen to change another variable value and then it just goes crazy uh there is actually very super hard to debug so uh one way to approach uh such kind of problems is to use some tools designed for memory management and maybe the most famous one or in my case the one that i got to use most it's a uh, Balgreen. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing right, but well, let's call it Balgreen. So uh, let's go to an example. Uh, yeah, so I made this memory CPP file. So it's it can be maybe uh, the most uh, anti uh, computer science. <laughs> source code that you might find it has all the everything that they have told you for many years not to do so you probably already got what's the problem here but uh, you had this uh, array of two elements uh, called a and yes and now i'm iterating and then i'm going from zero to ten so i suppose it has ten elements so i'm gonna go to some memory address which well is not specified and then in the second part, I'm making a pointer to a uh, uh, dynamic integer uh, with the belly one. And then I delete the pointer. I make a null, which is actually the right thing to do. But now later, I use it with that pointer. So, well, can you uh, do that? <laughs> I don't think so. So let's see what happens. I compile my. Oh, not this one, the other one, sorry. My memory, CPP, and it compiles right, no error. Uh, just for the sake of uh, knowing a little bit more, let's see what's happening if I enable more, no, no error. Even if I put all the warnings, it doesn't actually get to know what's going on. So compiler thing is right, so you might think it's right. So what's happened when we run it? Uh, the keyboard is in a very awkward position. Okay, now here we go. Well, so we got these two first elements, right? And then for the rest eight elements, you get whatever. It's a memory. And finally, uh, this for our pointer that we're trying to print out, it's uh, the value of the variable, it's memory address is pointing to. We finally got a segmentation fault, which is like a big F U that the computer throws to you when, well, you made that kind of call. So, okay, so how can I approach this? Maybe, let's run Valgrin and let's see what we get. Uh, oh yeah, of course. So, hmm. Well, we got our information here. The fair thing is that uh, we are using an initialized value of eight size. Pretty much what it's saying that, uh, did we get the main, uh, what is it? Uh, there was a trick actually to know the line number. How oh, sh Well, so more or less you can figure out uh, after you print out these two elements, it say, okay, you are using eight more elements, actually, you're trying to use that so you never initialize them. And that's a pretty good hint, actually. And then for the rest parts, 
you get this like a uh, in main the address zero which is null it's not in the stack it's not malloc or it's has been recently free so yeah it's also a very good hint actually <laughs> you're trying to ex access the address zero which is actually impossible so yeah here we go and in this example it's very trivial what we have done but normally it's actually quite uh oh there's a useful option so you see uh, they have many options that actually it can filter out these outputs so let's try out with this one let's see what's let's see what happened so yeah you get the same theme pretty much yeah it wasn't useful for us anyways so uh in other non-trivial programs you might find quite helpful actually uh what it gives to you and mostly it's uh how can i call it it's like a prevention tool so by the time that you compile your software and then you test it it's always good actually to run this bug green it's gonna go much slower however uh you will make sure that your code is consistent and maybe I mean, well, you cannot never make sure 100%. You have to test it like you have. You need to have 100% test coverage. However, you get a good hint that things are going right. So yeah, uh, my advice to you is uh, before you submit your assignments, just run it through here, and then just to make sure that you're not messing up with the memory. So next part is a bean grep okay so from here uh i'm gonna go through like a few so a few of the slides actually are focused on vim uh, i'm sorry if you like emacs but well i like vim and that's what i know about it they said it doesn't mean that it's actually absolutely better than emacs or whatever it is it's just that uh, it's not what i know it's not it's the editor I know on detail and well I find it quite useful. So being grep. So when you are using Visual Studio or some other tools, it's actually useful to let's say uh, search one string amongst multiple files. So Okay, let's give an example. So let's go to another folder. I had my the source code of one of my softwares, which is actually it's quite big actually. Uh, maybe you can see it's uh it's big. So uh, many files there and some of the files. Well, I tried to keep it small, but some of them maybe five hundred lines or. And then, is you can always use grep to find things so maybe class I, i'm sure that this word is repeated many times so yeah there we go <laughs> it's a lot of a lot of times right and well uh, l let's make it inside a source so well maybe that's all the class we got here and yeah, so I forgot the recursive. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So he he this all the time that the uh, keyword class was uh, typed in the code. So it's okay, it's nice. But you, if you want to use BIM, then now if I let's say I have to go one by one and then source node machines, then maybe HH and then. I need to search for the line, which is very inconvenient. So what if VIM actually includes that feature? And the good news, it actually is included by default. And it's actually, it's called Bing Rep. So we write class here. And then search, because we want to inside that folder. And then here we go. We got the first result actually right there. And then if we open the C open, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the C open comments, but pretty much it's some sort of like uh, 
view or like a window for this kind of feature that VIM offers you. So here you have, you have all the hits. So you can go one by one or you can search and then it will actually, yeah. You will jump to the, the line that actually has a keyword. It's really helpful. And we just input, I mean, what it comes inside these quotes is a uh, regular expression. We just input uh, just a normal word, but well, you can make many things there. It's out of the scope to, to cover our regular expression, but if you are familiar with that, then it's obvious that you can actually, it becomes all the time way more powerful. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a great thing. And I use it daily. And if you get used to, if you have, especially if you have a large amount of files in your projects, it comes pretty handy. Uh, next, VIM mouse support. So, uh, well, so that's the title. But what I wanted to show, so remember, this is a tutorial a seminar for undergrad students, mostly graduate students that they're kind of new to this uh, Linux developing thing. And so you might find that everything is using the terminal, which is actually inconvenience. Uh, well, it's uh, used every, all the time the keyboard, and which is amazing. You have the shortcuts and you go quick, fast. Uh, your hands doesn't suffer as much, but sometimes logically, some things are obviously easier to do it with the mouse. So. Let me show you something. I had this session. Oh, well, I know it's not very open, but well, let's say uh, I have many tabs. And some of the tabs, yeah. So let's say I want to jump from the tab, no name, last one to the no name first. And I can just do that. It works. And now let's say I'm opening this big file. Uh, it might, it's open, so it's a big file. It's uh, 400 lines. What if I can just use the scroll? I'm using the scroll in the mouse. And you cannot see it, but I'm using it. So it's great, right? And then I can put the cursors here. And it's good. I mean, if you're using the keyboard, you will have to like uh, move it certain times or actually compute with your, with your head how many lines up or how many lines down which I don't know, maybe it makes you more intelligent, but well, I think it's a waste of time. So uh, yeah, that's it. And it's really great. And it goes handy with many things. I can open a new tab as well. I mean, it's like a, it's like a Chrome actually. <laughs> uh, and yeah, it has many things. Uh, yes, as uh, extra information, Tmax also supported. And actually VIM is well supported. Uh, it's all about, uh, I need some options actually to support it. And the option for VIM for you to know. So you can see later, I had all this information posted on the internet. Uh, well, uh, here we go. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's it. That option actually will make it work. And then if you want to make it work inside TMX, then you need to enable some action for Tmux, which is uh, around here. So remember, uh, down there. It, it was actually really hard to make it work. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, here it is. Yeah, so those options actually made it work. I think that the main one it's uh, was this one. I remember, yeah. The other ones are to enable certain features with the mouse, but well, so yeah, it's great. Uh, I recommend you to use it and just make your life easier. So moving fast. <clears throat> so you have seen it, that's uh, I have used, uh, you might have seen that I have used like a, uh, some sort of VIM configuration. 
Ah, it's something weird with uh, this one. Okay. And that configuration has this thing that actually made me jump very fast to whatever file I want to go. Uh, maybe before you have seen this one, it's really great, actually. Uh, okay, let's open again this peer DFS thing. I also had this one. It actually let me jump to every function right away. And tons of more of them. So I have many pl it's plugins, it's their add-ons for BIM. And it's uh, it's not that easy to install them. So kind of like if you want to do it by yourself, uh, you have to read the menu, the re readme file for each of them. And then you need to uh, copy some files in some folders and then, yeah, so each of them are different and it's not good. So we got this very nice plugin which actually beats, well, <laughs> doesn't beat any other plugin, but well, it's uh, maybe the only plugin you will install manually, which actually manage the rest of the plugins. So here's it. Uh, it's a uh, B. So you just write like this, the plugin you want to install, and then you do, plugin updates or install it first, but I cannot reinstall, so I just update it to show it to you. And well, we wait a little bit and then it will install the plugins. It's easy as that. So if you want to find some information about this, uh, I mean, which plugin has this code, it's what it means is that the first part, it's uh, the user in GitHub and the second part is a GitHub repository name. But well, it's all a scatter in the GitHub. So it's there is a website which actually have very nice uh, collection of all the things. So as I remember, it's called VIM Awesome. Awesome, uh, VIM Awesome. And yeah, it has a rank, it's yeah, it look pretty cool actually. So yeah, I pretty much use most of them. <laughs> yeah. So for example, if you want to install this nerd tree, which is, uh, you don't get a picture. I would be great if you get a picture, but this nerd tree is this thing. The thing that you get here is a nerd tree. So if you want to install a thing, uh, just add this code and then reload the file and then plug install. It's good, it's great. Okay, moving forward, let's close this thing. Okay, everything installed correctly. What's our next part? Yeah, maybe this view is better. So yeah. So I will talk about a few plugins. The very first one, it's uh, maybe the most powerful one and the most useful one. It's uh, it's called Fugitive and it's actually about Git. So I assume that you know a little bit about Git, but it's a version in software which actually it's pretty powerful and it lets you save your projects, states, and well, it's uh, it's out of the topic at this moment to talk about this exactly, but well, it's, you get some troubles that you need to merge your calls every some time. And this plugin really help you with that. And, and not only that, also go through the log and go through many, if you want to make difference, if you want to stage things. So, okay, I'll give an example. You know, examples are most are much easier to follow than, than actually theoretical explanation. So yeah, let's, let's open a new one and then we end this pure DFS. All of these uh, Git, it's a Git project. 
Uh, so yeah, we have some status at the moment. We, we, don't, we don't care about those files. And, well, the first thing, how in how many commits this file has been uh, modified? So this part of the fugitive plugins, they ha it has many comments. So one of them is git log. Well, that's quite a lot, right? <laughs> I mean, we always modify this code, so. Yeah, so here we go. So this is this version, and this is this version, and this is a previous version, and so on. So you can go backtrack so easily. Very powerful. Oh, uh, let's reopen this one, okay. Second part. Let's say that someone in this line of code, he made a very stupid bug, so we want to blame him. It's just this one. Oh, wait, so it was me. <laughs> okay, so let's say that in this line of code. So pretty much what it does is that for every line of code, you get who was the last guy who modified. It's pretty awesome, actually, and it's helpful to know so mostly, uh, it's not more about blaming people, but it's all about if you want to modify some code, if you were the last guy who modified, then yeah, you can go ahead. It's easy, right? But if some other guy modify, maybe it's a little bit more tricky because it means that uh, maybe that code actually depends on other code and that's why he made it that way. So, well, it's kind of, it's a good information. <laughs> I will say. And okay, let's follow. Let's continue with the features. Uh, what about the diff? Let's find the difference between this version and the previous version. Previous, previous. Ah, uh, oh god. Oh yeah, because we have this previous version. Okay, okay. Got it. If uh, I believe that's uh, Okay, and then we can go the other way. Uh, this MR, okay. Uh, maybe uh, we can check the difference between our file and another branch. That's actually my show well. I mean, yeah, Refactor Winter. Well, they are the same. I wonder why. Ah, oh, sorry, this file has not been changed for a long time. My mistake. Uh, so we need to go to another one. This one was changed for sure recently. So git diff had back back. It means like a two commits before. Yeah, here we go. That's what I wanted to show. So it's a pretty nice way to see what has been changing. Especially if you got this uh, colleague working with you that uh, he said he sent you a patch about some new feature, something that some bug that he fixed. Uh, it's much better to see in this way, so you can see how was before and how was later. So you can see exactly what he wrote. And well, that's I mean, making uh, using the uh, div feature it's pretty helpful. So uh, they have way more features, and 
it's kind of out of the scope to go through all of them, but is, is this a brief uh, seminar? I have to continue with more with the next slides and next topics. So, NER3. This is fast, um, but it's also pretty useful. So, NER3, uh, we, we already talked about this one. It's this thing here. So, it's very simple to, to configure. It's very simple to use. And it doesn't really have much things. So, if you want to know the uh, help, just uh, press the interrogation sign. And then here you go. So yeah, you mostly use like um, not all of them, some of them, and you have the bookmarks there, and then you can open, you can go through the folders, you can open one of them, and then if you press T, you can open as a tab, the other one, and then if you press S, you can open as another window. And yeah, it's uh, it's good to get a structure of the, I mean, some visual structure of how the f uh, directory tree looks like for the projects. So because in the command line, it's kind of hard to get an idea. It's uh, it's not visual at all. So it kind of helps you in that way. And then to make a new file, it's also easy. You, for, you, for instance, if I want to make a new file in this data folder, I press M and then now, yeah, I want to add, so A, and then my file, and then I'll enter. I'm not gonna do it, but well, you got it. So yeah, simple, easy, and fast. It's, I totally recommend it. Next one, it's uh, the autocomplete feature. So for this case, I'm gonna make an example. Yeah, okay. Well, session one. Backtrack. Session one. So we are in this main end with the interior overflow. Let's comment it out everything. We don't need this one. And here we go. I want to use a string. And then my string, tr. I all of a sudden forgot all the methods. Oh, if I press tab, actually, I get all of them. So I want to replace, and now I forgot as well. Uh, well, so yeah, I had this one that I need to first say the position. And well, it's not pretty helpful this way, but, but yeah, you get the idea, right? So you get the signature of all the functions you want to use. And resize is, for example, pretty, fairly simple. It's only the size you want to resize and push back. It's actually great. Uh, you don't have to go to your web browser and then read the reference website for C++. Now you got it here. Well, so as I said, simple and easy. And configuring this thing is a little bit hard. And the main reason is that, uh, I'll show you in a minute. It's, you actually have to uh, install CLang compiler. And well, that's fine. And then you need to configure. And then in order to configure, uh, you need to have to do something like this. So you need to specify where your dynamic library for the CLang is located. In my case, I may, I did it through this environmental em, environment variable. And yeah, so it has some things and well, it's not that easy, but it works. Uh, another thing about this one is that, uh, I'm not sure how it works with this one. Yeah, yeah it works. So uh, if you want to see how I was implemented some of the functions, just press control and then a square bracket, square right bracket, 